and welcome to Arts Alive. This week we're at the Tate Liverpool for the launch of Works to Know by Heart that is made up of two exhibitions, an imagined museum that gathers more than 60 work from the Centre Pompidou in Paris, MMK in Frankfurt and the Tate Gallery. The second exhibition brings out the best of French artist Henri Matisse, famously known for his modern art and his extensive use of colours in his paintings. Can you tell us what is Imagine Museum? Because it's based on a, a crazy idea as well. It's based on a crazy idea. So basically we're inviting all our visitors into a fictional scenario where you come into the gallery and it's the year 2052 and we're saying all these artworks are about to disappear. Art is being removed from public life and when that happens, everything that's great about art is going to disappear. So we really need everyone's help to, to help us remember and preserve these works and what's important about them for the future. Right. So yeah. yeah, that was based on Ray Bradbury's uh, book Fahrenheit 451, right? Exactly. That's the initial uh, initial kind of starting point behind the book. So the thing that was, um, to just very briefly explain, um, Bradbury sets his novel in 2052, um, going into 2053, and he um, imagines this kind of um, very strange future in which all of culture is really sidelined and people are so plugged into their TVs and uh, conforming to this very rigid state that um, books are actually banned and firefighters are no longer fight fire but they, they seek out books and burn them. Uh, and the thing that was really important to us about this book was that at the end of the novel the protagonist Montag finds himself in this kind of rebel community where um, he finds these, this group of people on the, um, on the outskirts of the city who are like, gathered around a campfire and they've each taken it upon themselves to remember and preserve themselves each of the books that they think is important. So they talk about each of them being, um, being like uh, slip covers or um, being, being the covers for books. So we were thinking about this idea of can, can people be frames for artworks? Can people really you know, take, become vessels and take these things with them into the future and remember them in, I think, quite personal and, and quite different ways. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, for this exhibition you've worked, it's a collaboration between uh, yeah. three places, the Centre Pompidou in Paris and in Metz and yeah. uh, the MMK in Frankfurt and the Tate. Yeah. So how did, you, how did you collaborate and how did you select the work? Because based on this idea of works to know by heart, yeah. you've got to select uh, artwork that are going to stay, but how do you differentiate them from the one that maybe we shouldn't keep, I don't know. Exactly, I mean it was a very interesting collaboration and it was really a, a big curatorial collaboration so when we, um, f f kind of framing the choice of works in the exhibition we were really talking about um, what are the key values that art can kind of help us to understand and what are the different aspects of our existence and of everyday life that art can help us interrogate. So I think the very fact of doing it with, um, with curators from these other institutions felt that we were be being less kind of single curators saying this is the work that I believe is important. They're more like really a European um, collaboration where we were all kind of making... Uh, Make, making contributions and, and finding something that was much less personal and much more kind of shared. Great. Yeah. But does it mean that some pieces of art should be kept and, and others, I mean, you don't want to let we don't, others... We don't want to let anything <laughs> disappear. No, of course. No. And really, you know, we, we, have, we had to set ourselves quite a clear remit and this is work from 1945 to the present. Okay. So it's really trying to focus in on a particular area and at the same time we're also encouraging all our visitors to add a work that they feel is not included that should perhaps have been so um, there's a section at the end of the exhibition where we've put up an empty frame which has come from um, from our stores in London and this is the point where anyone can, having seen the exhibition, enact and perform and explain a work that they feel needs to absolutely be remembered and tells us something else that all these works in the exhibition don't necessarily 
give us. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's a, I mean, you're trying to be very interactive with this ex exhibition. It's not exactly. just like staying in front of a painting and, well, trying to get emotions from it, but it's also kind of participating into it. Exactly. And for us, it's really about emphasizing and focusing on the active role that we want our visitors to have. So we've always talked about and really emphasized the point of Tate being a public institution and the Tate collection belonging to the public. Likewise, the MMK collection and the Pompidou collection are public collections, they're ours. So we really want to find uh, everyone's emotional connection and emotional ownership of these works and, and bring that to the fore. Mm -hmm. So this is really what's happening on this uh, weekend that comes in February once the exhibition's been deinstalled. Uh, we have a weekend called 2053, a living museum where all the artworks are going to be gone and we will have brought together our own kind of rebel community yes. where everyone will take on a work and remember it and perform it and, and describe it in, in different ways. And I'm hoping for really quite different ways as well. So it's going to be a really exciting experiment, I think. But, you know, some people might describe every inch of a painting surface or some people might have a very personal story about the first time they saw a work or some people might think about making a musical interpretation of it. All these things that are immaterial that somehow without the use of any other, any kind of objects, somehow are a, somehow you're able to evoke what a work means to you. Yeah, I was thinking, like, if you were to describe a painting that has disappeared, how would you do that? And would the point be to describe the actual painting or to describe the emotion that the painting well, makes you feel? Both, absolutely yeah. both. And I think, I mean, I'm, I will probably be performing a work at the final weekend and I haven't really thought yet about how I will do it. I think it absolutely depends on the work as well. So I'm very interested to see what, um, what people think. And when you get to the end of the exhibition, there's a, uh, a sign-up box where you can say, I want to be involved. This is the work I want to do. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. Yeah. Coming back on, on the idea of, I mean, on the book on Fahrenheit 451, yeah. this idea where literature is uh, ban, banished, mm -hmm. yeah. um, is this something that could happen to art, do you think? I mean, it's, it's absolutely not going to happen in the foreseeable future, I don't think. And really, it, when Bradbury was writing this book in the 1950s, I don't think there was any more of a real threat that this was going to happen. But I think it's the, the beauty for me of science fiction is that it proposes these entirely impossible and unlikely scenarios that in some way allow us to reflect on, on life as it is yeah. at the moment. So no, we're definitely not saying this is going to happen in the near future, this is a real urgency, but there's something about entering into this fiction that I think can be, yeah. it can be quite productive in allowing us to look at things in a new way. Yeah. But I mean, because yeah. I think he was probably thinking that for, um, you know, the burning of books by the Nazis in, during the Second World War, yeah, and then, and of, yeah. Of course, there are those, those historical yeah. precedents so that he was... Yeah, elements of yeah. elements of it did happen, I think, but the the future that he envisages is certainly far fetched. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, Lauren. Again, it's thank a you. Pleasure. Aside from an imagined museum on the fourth floor, Tate is also exhibiting a whole body of work from French painter and sculptor Henri Matisse. The artist, who started painting in 1890, soon developed a simplified style, and his work evolved considerably from still-life canvases to fauvist artworks in the early 20th century. Towards the end of his life, Matisse started the cutouts from which the snail is extracted. Matisse in Focus is an opportunity to bring to Tate Liverpool for the first time in its 27 year history the snail which is the giant work you see behind us and it's never travelled to Liverpool before and it was really a rare opportunity to get it in the gallery for six months and we decided to bring it together with almost all of the works by Matisse and Tate's collection to do a focus presentation of over 50 years of his practice. And why is the snail so important? 
Well, it belongs to his final body of works known as the cutouts, where he used painted pieces of paper and cut them with dressmaking scissors or tore them by hand and had his studio assistants arrange them on the wall of his studio because at that point, the last decade of his life, he was basically bedridden. He was in his 80s, he had had a series of operations and he wasn't physically able to paint anymore. So in essence, Matisse, revolutionized his own practice by inventing a brand new technique that was a hybrid of drawing in color, painting and almost sculpture using the paper as individual fragments to produce something that was on a scale much bigger than most of his paintings throughout his life. So he didn't reduce his scale or his ambition even in his final years and the snail was made just the year before he passed away. And is there a symbol behind this? Is there a signification behind this snail? Well, he talked about being inspired by the snail as an animal in nature, but as you can see, it's also really abstract. So what he ended up producing was something inspired by the circular pattern of a snail shell, but he didn't tie it completely to nature. He left it as a sort of free-floating abstract design, which is very unique within his practice. And I think that's why it's such an important work, because you can see him at the end of his life almost reaching towards something that's like abstract art, and that was very different from his focus on the figure and the landscape in many of his previous paintings and sculptures. Join us after the break, we'll find out more about Matisse in Focus, Tate's new exhibition. Welcome back to Arts Alive. This week we're looking at Tate's new exhibitions. Amongst them is Matisse in Focus, centered around the gigantic snail painting. This is from the early 50s, so really um, he had sort of developed through Fauvism, which was early in his career where he worked with other artists and they were renowned for their bright use of colour. And in a way the snail and many of the other cutouts are almost a return to his earlier self and his sort of joyous use of colour. But it's really the scale that's different and what we want people um, who visit the gallery at Tate Liverpool to see is the work in person and how huge it is compared to how you would maybe imagine it from a reproduction or seeing it on a website. And I think it's that opportunity to see the artwork in person that's really exciting. And so we have, uh, so there's the snail, but there's uh, a whole body of work around as well. And uh, it's not just painting, it's, he was sculpt sculpting as well. Yeah, Matisse was both painter and sculptor. He trained in both mediums. And what we have in the In Focus exhibition is 10 paintings and five sculptures. Um, one of them is a very small bronze of a reclining nude, and four are known as the Bax series, which is actually his largest body of sculpture in scale. And it was something that he worked on for many decades, beginning around 1910, but they weren't cast until the year after his death in bronze. So they have a kind of um, duration throughout his career and what he does is evolve his representation of the human figure, a female nude again, from something very physical and representational into something that becomes like abstract shapes. Um, so that again relates to the snail and his kind of evolution of his practice and what we have in the shroom is a chance to see 50 years of one artist's practice in focus and that's a really rare opportunity. And when you were talking about the snail, the fact that it's kind of abstract, it lets the viewer interp interpret whatever they want. This is part of, I mean, this is linked with an Imagine Museum as well, inviting the people to interact with the work as well. Yeah, it's very important for us that our visitors receive that invitation, that we want them to be a part of the experience and their own understanding of the work is as important as anything that we could say as curators. And that certainly links to our special exhibition on the top floor of the galleries, which opens tomorrow as well. And 
the idea of memory and of finding a work that you want to know by heart and to learn and to cherish is really important and really what we're saying is that art has a really crucial role in society and somebody like Matisse was a very important figure obviously in France but worldwide and even though he died more than half a century ago his legacy and his impact on 20th century art continues to reverberate and that's true of many of the artists in Imagine Museum as well. Thank you very much Stephanie. Thank you. The collection presented at Tate Liverpool includes another famous painting, The Inattentive Reader, designed in 1919. John Hughes, assistant curator, gives us an insight into this mysterious figure. This is a painting by Henri Matisse, one of the most famous artists again from the 20th century, uh, particularly the first half of the 20th century. Again, what we might call sometimes the golden age of modernism, uh, those great names like Picasso and Matisse. We, we might say actually that Matisse and Picasso are these two in some ways competing rivals, uh, but also have a great respect for each other as well. Later in life, after this painting, a few decades later, they become friends, you know, kind of visiting each other in Paris. Uh, so kind of influencing each other, but also a bit of a rivalry going on as well at the same time. Uh, Matisse, we often say, is the great colorist of the beginning of the 20th century. Whereas Picasso was moving away, I suppose, from traditional rules to do with perspective and depicting space. Uh, whereas Matisse has been quite influenced a little bit by that. He's deliberately eschewed the rules of perspective here. This floor isn't uh, a flat floor going off into the distance. It's been kind of tilted up like that, as if it's kind of we're looking straight down at it. And also, but yet everything is kind of resting on the floor. So there is a bit of that Picasso playfulness going on there as well. But also with Matisse, we often think of as a as a as a new way of using colour. Uh, sometimes a non-naturalistic use of colour, if I can put it that way. Uh, he's been painting like this since 19. This painting was done in 1919, so he's been painting like this for a, for a number of years and, and throughout the First World War even as well, he's still using these bright colours. Um, uh, him and his friend in 1905, André Durand, they would travel to the south of France and I think that's where he begins to start really becoming you know, celebratory about colour, those warm, the warm climate at the south of France, the heat, the brightness of the sun, all those beautiful colours. Well, all that comes into the paintings. Uh, and he's still painting like this here in 1919, but this would have been done in Paris, probably a very different environment to that, you know, that kind of, where, where you, if you're in Nice, for example, with the sun and the colours around you. Uh, however, what's going on here is, is a freer use of paint, a freer use of colour. Uh, what we call a Fauvist style, if I can blind you with isms again, Fauvism. Uh, Fauvism really um, was, a, was a criticism actually. It was a critic who said, oh, you're all Fauves. And the word Fauve meaning wild beasts. The way you paint, you're like wild beasts, you're like monkeys let loose with a paint box. Uh, a lot of term, terminology in art is, is, is often a criticism. Impressionism was actually a criticism by a critic. You are merely impressionists or you are fauves. And these names have kind of stuck. Uh, well, of course, it is a wilder use of paint. It's a freer use of paint. And Matisse, of course, was quite, quite happy with a freer use of paint and a freer use of colour. Often he would change the colour of people's faces and people's skin. If I was Matisse and I was painting you and we were in a cold room, I might give you a blue face. Now you haven't really got a blue face, but by giving you a blue face, I can, I can show you, I can show the, I can show the viewer how you're feeling. I can show the, the atmosphere in the room, perhaps all those things. So you might even argue that this use of colour is more realistic. It can show something more real than the photograph. It's um, actually closer to the subject matter than a realistic depiction. Uh, this picture, I love the title of this picture because the title is The Inattentive Reader. Uh, the inattentive reader meaning, and I often talk to children about this painting, and I often ask them, I often say, have you ever been in class and your teacher has said to you, oh, read a book, everyone, and you're reading a book and you're going, yeah, yeah, I'm reading, honestly. Honestly, I'm reading, and you're looking out the window and you're looking everywhere except the book. Well, that's exactly what she's doing here. She's got lots on her mind. Um, she's not really there at all, is she? She's got this kind of 
pent-up sort of thoughtful face, uh, locked on her mind and looking away from the book. Everybody is looking away from the book. Uh, Matisse isn't particularly interested in the book. It's been painted quite quickly there. Uh, she's not interested in the book. Everybody is contemplating, and the viewer as well isn't interested in the book. Everybody is contemplating this room in their own kind of unique sort of way, I suppose. Uh, so painting like this in a freer way isn't really um, further away from the subject matter. You could argue that Matisse is getting closer to the subject matter. She here, we don't really know who she is, this model, um, although there is a, a sense of intimacy between the male Matisse and this woman in this very female sort of space. If anyone had said to me that this was painted by a woman, I probably would have believed them. It's somehow a very sort of feminine space. So you've got this male painter in this feminine space in a very sort of intimate sort of way. Um, but also I think as well, there's a, there's a word on the label over there which says interiority, interiority. Now that could mean the interior, of course, but also it's about her own interiority, what's going on up here as well. So even though there's something quite playful and free, I think it's quite a sophisticated painting because he's really captured this attitude, this pensive sort of attitude as well. You could also say, you could also say that she's, uh, she's quite casual in her attitude. There's a certain sort of ho-hum, la-la-la sort of attitude as she's leaning there with the book there. Uh, and I think this casual use of paint and her casual attitude come together. So again, the use of paint is actually more about, um, more about her attitude, uh, showing something more than a photograph as well. Now flowers often appear in paintings, uh, in still life paintings obviously, and they're often a reminder of death, he says cheerfully there, a reminder of what we call a memento mori, a reminder of our mortality. And even though it's very freely painted, you've got this mirror behind the flowers there, and uh, so the flowers kind of stand out. Uh, and she may also be contemplating this as well, this kind of very contemplative uh, feel to this picture, maybe contemplating life, contemplating mortality or whatever else there as well. The fact that it was done in 1919, which is just after the First World War and done in Paris, there might have been at this point a little brief moment of casual sort of decadent sort of freedom. If you think of the great cities of Europe, um, if you think of Berlin, if you watch Cabaret for example, if you see Berlin between the wars before the Nazi boot comes along and stamps and everything again the same with Paris we've got this little moment of, of decadent sort of freedom and creativity again before the Nazi boot comes along and stamps on it again so uh, I, I mean maybe I'm overlooking into this picture here in 1919 but I think there's something definitely going on here in 1919 it's a picture that wouldn't have been painted like this uh, later in Europe as well I don't think so anyway um, Matisse of course uh, people often say you know, later on with his cutouts and he becomes more and more abstract as, as, as time goes on. There are huge paintings and collages like the snail, for example. Um, so this interesting colour stays with him for the rest of his life. But a lot of people say that Matisse starts abstract art along with Picasso. But again, you could argue here that Matisse is not an abstract artist. You could say that this freer use of paint, and of course we've talked about Jackson Pollock, the artists become freer and more expressive with paint. They become more and more abstract with paint as the 20th century goes on. So you could say that the roots of abstraction lie in paintings like this. However, I would say that this freer use of paint actually is about her, is about her attitude and this whole sort of decadent, sort of free, casual, relaxed, yet a little bit pensive, sort of worried expression on her face. Works to know by heart and Imagine Museum will be on display until the 14th of February. Matisse in Focus can be seen on the ground floor of the gallery until May 2016. That's all this week on Arts Alive, see you next time.